today's seminar about today's seminar about lockdown social security and perspective uh, mostly based on social science and will be covered through uh, i mean, i don't know hardcore economics by two distinguished speaker one from kolani university and one from jollal level university and in the last seven or eight months or more than that this is a very hot topic discussed in several newspapers about the impact of lockdown even it was discussed whether the lockdown was at all necessary or not to mitigate the problems of covid 19 because lockdown has uh, severely affected a huge number of people around the world and from uh, uh, economically backward people so uh, these things will, uh, will be covered today and the department of economics of barasat government college and the department of economics barasat vidhanagar uh, government college join hands to discuss this topics which uh, 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 which went through from very lower economic classes to higher classes and will surely be enriched through their lectures and question answer sessions so i thank everybody here and inaugurate the uh, webinar about the labor law reforms and social society social security and another topic some aspects of impact of covid 19 in this lockdown in india and the way forward these two uh, uh, these two sections specialized sections will be discussed thoroughly uh, from the broader headline lockdown social security and perspective which is being inaugurated by me now so thank you all uh, wish it a grand success over thank to you, dr rajan yes thank you sir next i would request uh, sri tapomoy das officer in charge of vidhanagar college to give his welcome address please uh thank you dr ghosh so um uh, good evening everybody um a very pleasant occasion understandably very pleasant occasion intellectually rich psychologically and socially very um, vibrant because of our um collaborative spirit i really take pride in uh, uh, welcoming the congregation and addressing it on this occasion of today's webinar uh, it's an academic assembly understandably of the teachers and the talk together i'm afraid the students also present here and i welcome them all so that this thing to this thing was as we are going to listen to is there any noise there uh, am i audible i'm sorry yes sir you are okay welcome so i welcome everybody to the, uh, the audience to the two distinct voices as i said maybe how can voices who knows how brilliant they could be okay and as i welcome them uh, the audience i mean i also similarly uh, welcome the uh, the invited speaker to this occasion where we are all present and uh, we are waiting on the tip to we have been on the tip to of expecting um, uh, some inspired and inspiring um, chairs to be delivered by them and uh, uh, a very uh, happy interactive session thereafter expectedly as regards myself i have two questions um which i would like to put in the 
uh, for just because I want some kind of uh, attempt being uh, um, made to touch upon these topics while delivering the lectures. The first one is about uh, the first speaker, Dr. Matri Paul of Kullai University. Uh, and my question is, uh, maybe that uh, her kind of uh, thinking could be different. But let me put it into perspective like this. Uh, if, if, uh, uh, so, if the social laws, just a minute, my dog is a, my question is, if the, if the law reforms stand in a direct proportional relationship to social security, then my question is, the logic could appear to be somewhat Hobbesian. I have in my mind, the Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. You all know about the subtitle of the book, it's about uh, the body politic. So that could be Hobbesian. In case the, this question uh, is not quite uh, intelligible right at this moment, I could put it in writing later on so that a response could be given. The second one, the second question is about the second uh, problem I have been, uh, which has has been disturbing me for a long time, and it's about the buoyancy of the capital market, uh, despite the disruptive forces because of the lockdown, disruptive forces in areas such as demand and supply, and why is it that the capital market isn't is so buoyant, so very vibrant, not in India alone, but outside also, especially in the um, uh, uh, in the powerful economies like uh, America. Uh, Russell 2000, for example, Dow Jones, NASDAQ, all have a vibrancy of their own, all have a buoyancy of their own. own. So my question is why and how? So these are the things I put into perspective. And now let me come to the conclusion. I actually am uh, very inspired by the ideas of the topics. I'm not going to mention them because it, 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 that uh, the topics are on everybody's mind and i just to wish the occasion a grand success thank you jasnanda me uh, unmute for you okay sorry i will now request our speakers to start but before that two announcements need be made one uh, regarding um, sound so i would request every participant to keep the microphone off during the speech time. And another point is that we should not disturb our speakers during the speech time. After the two speeches are over, there will be an interactive session and you can raise your questions and queries then. And as you all know that uh, there are two speakers today. And our first speaker is Dr. Atripal. Dr. Atripal is assistant professor in the Department of Commerce at Kollan University. She has specialized in different areas of economics, such as growth and employment, women empowerment, and financial inclusion. But today, she will speak on the specified topic, labor law reforms and social security. Labor law reforms and social security, obviously in the perspective of COVID crisis. Madam, you may kindly start now. I request Dr. Atripal to start now, please. please. Um, good evening, uh, sir, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, 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 you are audible. Okay, yes, a very audible. good, okay, okay, sir, thank you. Okay, a very good evening to the chief patrons of the webinar, the Professor Shamu Chattopadhyay, WBACS, uh, Principal Barashat Government College, Professor Topomoy Dash, WBES, Officer in Charge, Bidhanagar Government College, the organizers, the faculty members of the Department of Economics of Barashat Government College and Bidhanagar Government College, all the other esteemed members present here, and my dear students. Uh, so, uh, thank you for inviting me in this webinar. Uh, uh, sir, may, uh, can you give me the permission to present the screen? I would of like course. to present the PPT. Of course, of course. Of course.
So is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. So is the screen visible? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the topic that I will discuss today is about the labor market scenario, the labor market reforms, and the social security. That is actually <coughs> a very uh, eminent issue in our uh, in our econ the, in our field of economics, and not only in field of economics. Everyone today is actually very excited and very uh, uh, eager to know about these things because this topic, this topic of employment, this actually this topic is related to employment, and we know that employment is actually a factor which contributes, which not only contributes to the production of goods and services in the country, but it also generates the income, the livelihood on the other hand. So therefore, it constitutes a critical link between the economic growth and the economic development via the trickle down mechanism. A country which does not which is not able to provide gainful employment to the citizens cannot become a developed one. It will always be lagging behind. So let us start. I will first start with some glimpses of the Indian labor market. Uh, I know that uh, this seminar is also actually related to the COVID-19 crisis. But before going into the scenario of employment and the labor market reforms, that has occurred during the COVID-19 pandemic, I would like to highlight certain glimpses of the existing Indian labor market, the employment and the unemployment scenario, which was present actually from the post-reforms era. Because this will help us to understand whether actually the COVID-19 mediated the COVID-19 pandemic mediated crisis has led the Indian economy to such a distressed situation or whether the story is something else, whether the loopholes were present from the past and actually the um, uh, pandemic has exposed these loopholes. So let us start with the scenario of the uh, labor market in India. Now let us start with unemployment situation, and we can see that is this unemployment. Uh, this data is uh, is from 1993-94 to 2019-20. This is because I have chosen this period because this data is available. The data on employment unemployment is available uh, from the uh, uh, National Sample Survey Organization. And this sample, this National Sample Survey, survey Organization, the NSSO, they provides data on various rounds for the employment unemployment survey. And so from 1993 to 19, from 1993-94 to 2011-12, the data which you can see, uh, please look at the bar diagram, which you can see this data has been taken from the employment unemployment survey of NSSO. But then from 2017-18 onwards, the data has been taken from periodic labor survey. Now, there is quite a discrepancy. There are uh, many arguments that whether these two data are comparable or not, these two platforms are comparable or not because of certain reasons. But still, uh, more or less, they can give us a, a crude picture of the employment and unemployment scenario, even, even they are not properly comparable on various grounds. So if we look at the unemployment, if we look at the number of persons unemployed uh, in millions from 1993-94, you can see that uh, the actually the numbers have been increasing little, but it has been uh, remained uh, more or less stagnant up to 2011-12. But when we come, when we look at the data for 2017-18, we can see there is a huge jump from 10.8 million number of people being unemployed in 11-12. The number has increased to 28.5 million in 2017-18. And as you can see in the right hand side, it is a paper cutting from the Hindu, which says that at this point, when the data for 2017-18 was released, it came up uh, in the actually this report was uh, initially it was leaked out, then it was released officially. When the report was leaked out, the people, they, the economists, the administrators, they were really uh, frightened to see that the unemployment rate has increased uh, to such a level that it is a 45 years high. The unemployment rate is a, a high among the for last 45 years. 
So this was the situation of unemployment in India before the COVID-19 pandemic strike. Because see, the last data is for 1920. It is, it is the latest available data. OK, uh, next. Uh, Let's move to the next one. So if we look at the employment scenario in uh, scenario in India in the post reforms period, we find that the labor participation rate, it has actually, what is labor participation, what is work participation rate? The work participation rate means the number of people who are employed divided by the number of people who are present in the labor force, okay, who are present in the labor force into 100 or into 1000 accordingly. So here, it is a percentage it is in a percentage form so we can see the workforce participation rate in india had uh, was at 42% in 1993-94 which has actually fluctuated over the years and ultimately become 38.2 in 2019-20 so if you look at this long run picture starting from 93-94 to 2019-20 you can see there is actually a declining trend in the in the workforce participation rate which gives us a rough idea about the employment scenario in india now if we look at the employment in the rural and the urban sectors uh, separately we will be able to find that the in both the rural sector and urban sector compared to 1993-94 in 2019-20 the employment has actually decreased but the workforce participation rate is lower in case of the urban area uh, this is mostly because in the rural area the people actually tend to take up any jobs which they find because the poverty is more pertinent in the rural areas Okay, then uh, coming to uh, the comparison of the workforce participation of the male and females, you can find that this pink bars refers to the male participation rate, work participation rate, and uh, the these brown ones are uh, for the females. And you can see over the years, actually, this female participation rate have been significantly less than those of the male participation rate. And moreover, one more thing is that not only they are less than the male participation rate, but whereas the male participation rate has remained more or less constant. See, it is almost constant. It has fluctuated a little over the years. But look at this female participation rate. The workforce participation rate of the females, it has actually declined from 28.6% to 17.6% in 2018-19, and thereby a little increase to 2000 but in 2019-18 to 21.8 percent that means see not only the female participation rate are lower than the male participation rate but they it has actually declined over the time okay now another factor another striking feature of our, our indian labor market is that it is identified it is characterized by a huge proportion of informal employment with a very small proportion of formal employment as you can see in this pie chart you can see that 89 percent of the workers in india they are informally employed whereas only remaining 11 percent are for are in formal employment and this is the latest data which has been uh, which i have taken from the periodic labor survey force 2019-20 it is the latest data available now if we come to the definition because this uh, this one this uh, what do we mean by informal employment formal employment that has to be very clear in our mind because the next part the second part of our uh, of my discussion will be on labor reform labor laws which actually needs to understand what will be what will be the impact of this law on the formal on the workers with formal and the workers with informal employment so if we uh, if we uh, officially take up the definition of informal workers, they are defined as the workers in the informal sector or in the household, people working in the households, and the workers even in the formal sector who are actually employed without any benef employment benefits or social security benefits provided by the employers. This is the definition which has been issued by the National Commission for Enterprises in the unorganized sector. Okay, so if we want to look uh, at the informal sector in terms of the mode of employment, see uh, the people, I'm uh, 
I am actually uh, telling this for the students, uh, the students group. See, if you take up a worker, then the workers can be categorized in terms of the mode of their employment. The workers can be either self-employed, they can be casual workers, or they can be regular salaried. Now, out of 461 million workers. In 2019, in Indian economy, it was found that 52% were self-employed, 24% were casual workers, and the remaining 24% were regular salaried. Now, according to Sundaram 2006, uh, he had given the idea, he had given a mechanism to find out the informal workers. And he has said that roughly the sum of the self-employed workers and the casual workers taken together, they form the informal workers. And so if we take the self-employed workers and the casual workers together, we will find that they add up to 350 millions. So already we get that the informal workers are 350 millions. Now come to the second portion, that is the regular salaried workers whom Sundaram have said that they can be considered as a representation of the formal sector. So if we consider that, that this workers, they are forming the formal sector, then among these 110 million workers, the data from 2019 shows that almost 60 million of them are informal workers. They are contractual workers who are devoid of any employment or social security benefits provided by the employers. So if we add this, here, was, here there were 350 million workers already present in the informal sector and 60 million from the formal sectors who are actually informal. Their nature of contract, is act, their nature of employment is actually informal. So the total number of informal sectors in our economy comes to be 410 out of 461 million um, uh, workers. So the informal workers in Indian economy almost comprises of 89% of the total workers, which is quite alarming. <clears throat> now, if we look in, look back into the history of why such a huge pool of informal workers are present in our economy, we can find that major three factors were present behind this. And all these factors are historical factors. The first factor was, uh, which has occurred in the colonial period, that there were actually mainly two group of workers at that time. The first group of work workers were the farm workers who worked in the farm. And the other group of workers were the non-farm workers. And in case of non-farm workers, there was a caste-based system of taking up their occupations, caste-based system. And it was find, found that the people belonging to the so-called lower caste, they actually were compelled to take up the professions which were informal they were not they didn't have any form of security and they are, uh, they were paid very less amount and they were work they had to work as bonded laborers also at times so this is actually historical and it date back to the colonial time now after we got our independence when uh, the planning period started uh, from the second five year plan when the focus was given to the uh, industrial development to uh, industrial development at that time the capital intensive uh, industries the development of these industries capital intensive uh, that was given a higher focus so that the industrial sector could get a boost and along with the ag agricultural development india could become also uh, also sustainable in terms of its industries so at that time, this uh, focus towards the capital intensive industry also made a problem that the workers in most of the manufacturing units, they were actually taken, they were absorbed as informal workers with very low payments and no social or employment securities. And this continued. And you will be surprised to know that it was only in the seventh five-year plan when in, Employment actually was taken up to be an important factor, important policy uh, prescription, because before that, till the sixth five year plan, it was thought that economic growth, if it is enhanced, if the economic growth is enhanced, then automatically it will uh, take care of the employment problems, the unemployment problems rather.
the employment will be generated automatically with growth uh, accelerating in the country but it was first time in the seventh five year plan when when it was realized and a separate agenda for employment as a policy prescription was taken up now this continued and in uh, sorry this continued and in the time of uh, when india adopted the in, uh, economic new economic reforms officially in 19 july 1991 what happened is that the private the public sector the government sector it started to roll back from different industries different sectors and the private sectors were given the hold of the economy gradually now the private sector in order to become competitive with the world market with the international market they wanted to become efficient and this and they chose their mean to be efficient mean to be efficient by decreasing the cost of labor okay they wanted to become competitive they wanted to become efficient by reducing the cost of labor and this resulted in a huge pool of casual huge pool of casual and informal labors which is one of the most important and striking factor of the indian labor market in the post reforms era so these are the major reasons behind the presence of such a huge pool of informal workers in our economy now this was already the situation the indian economy the indian employee labor market was already in distress with the unemployment ri rate rising at a huge rate the uh, rate of employment was declining the workforce participation rates were falling the total workers if we consider them then the 89% of these workers were present in the uh, informal sectors devoid of any forms of security already the uh, labor market in india was in a distressed condition and at this time the covid 19 pandemic struck the world along with it it struck the indian economy also and we all know that it is a medical crisis <coughs> which turned into an economic disaster and the world growth rate as per the imf estimate it was it will it was minus 3.5% it will be minus 3.5% during uh, this 2021 and the indian growth rate if you look at it it is minus 3.7.3% uh, during this period 2021 and it was actually this pandemic was actually declared as an uh, emergency under the national disaster management act and as a result of this in order to uh, restrict the spread of the virus a uh, series of lockdown was called on uh, in all in the um, other countries also also in india uh, just in the uh, beginning just in the beginning of the seminar uh, sir uh, proposed sir pointed out this that whether this lockdown was actually needed or not that is a very serious and pertinent question which actually arise in our mind nowadays because even with the lockdown with the series of lockdown that we have faced the rate of infection the rate of spread of the infection didn't actually <clears throat> decline so much as it was expected it would be okay whatever is the case a series of lockdown was initiated also in the indian economy and this led to a severe economic recession and this severe economic recession actually disrupted the production and the supply chain in the economy it led to a downslide in the economic growth there was a huge rise in the unemployment level there was a hike in the poverty and there was automatically a rise in the level of socio economic inequality so uh, there are various aspects of uh, the economic disruption that has come that has taken place during this pandemic situation but today i will focus on the labor market the changes that have occurred during the pandemic in our labor market now there are main if you look at the changes what has happened you can see that uh, there are three significant change which has come the first one is layout job loss and reduction in the income without any form of protection this is the first thing the second is the distress reverse migration which all of us have seen and uh, we have also seen the sufferings and the pain of the migrant labors then the, the third one is the dismantling of the labor laws so if we start with the first one the job loss during pandemic please look at this picture this is a picture which i have taken this figure picture i have taken from the ilo 
the indian labor or the international labor organization this is a picture which shows that relative to 2019 what is the job loss in terms of working hours in 2020 across the world and the darker is the shed okay of red it means the higher is the percentage of job loss and you can see if you look at the asian range india is one of the country which has one which has the darkest shade look here look at the other neighboring countries okay india is the country which has the highest which has the most darker shade in this region the south asian region so india was actually india has actually faced a huge damage to the livelihoods of the working class there has been a huge amount of layoff for an indefinite period there have been pay cut there have been job loss and this has actually more influenced the informal workers who we have already discussed that they comprises of 89% of the total workforce and there has been a huge leap in the unemployment rate so if we look at the unemployment rate in india over the uh, last starting from jan uh, january uh, 2020 okay if you look at the, that uh, fr from uh, january 2020 to august 2021 the last month data you will be able to see that i have marked four months with red color see this april 20 may 20 these are the months which marked the series of lockdowns in our country so from uh, Uh, compared to march uh, 2020 the unemployment rate in india in april 2020 increased to 23.52 percent and uh, urban and uh, if you look want to look at the urban and rural scenario it is also given here and also in the month of may it was 21.73 percent thereby from the month of june when this when the lockdown was uh, uh, in, uh, was lifted in a phase wise manner the unemployment rate started to decrease over the months but again in december 2020 we can see that there has been a mm, spike see this one there has been a rise in the unemployment rate again now this is because the december is a month where the kharif crop activities are closed down so there is a form of seasonal unemployment in the uh, rural sector and this has actually initially uh, increased the uh, uh, rate of unemployment in over in the overall economy again now again you can see there is a significant rise in may 2021 during may 2021 which is actually the period of the second wave in our economy it is the uh, time see may april may this period are the time for second wave of uh, the um, uh, covid 19 pandemic in our country there after again it is decreasing and it's actually fluctuating it is again little in it has again little increased in the month of august now next we move on to the next uh, next uh, point that we have discussed that actually three significant changes have taken place one is the loss of income and hike in the unemployment rate the second one is this one the distress uh, reverse migration now uh, this unexpected lockdown which was initiated uh, uh, overnight actually laid this uh, uh, huge uh, job loss for the uh, job loss and difficult especially for the migrant workers because uh, these migrant workers they tend to migrate to uh, uh, cities and big cities and towns in uh, where they live in slums and actually what happens is that they are quite poor and they don't have of they don't have much savings of their own so what happened this uh, overnight call of the lockdown made them jobless made them moneyless and they didn't also have money in several cases they didn't have money to uh, pay their rents in those uh, slums or in those houses they were residing in those uh, in the working places and they were actually also frightened that they won't be having any food they don't they don't they won't have any money they won't have any food and the fear of disease actually made them return to their native place but in the meantime the state borders were locked and only a very limited arrangement were made by the government for their return and this actually aggravated their miseries and we are all all know that how much suffering how much pain they have incurred during this period uh, during the return so many people have died there are so many incidences we have all read in the newspaper and we are all aware, aware of it now again uh, one another thing is that this absence of job card this employment registration ration card 
cards and the bank accounts in several cases absence of these thing also made them ineligible to get the direct benefit transfers which the government uh, the central government and the state government they announced from time to time to relieve the uh, people from this from the distress caused by this covid-19 pandemic so they, uh, really there was a distress condition of the migrant workers now the third significant change that we saw in the labor market during this pandemic period was the dismantling of labor laws now we all know that whenever we hear this term labor law we actually think about certain laws that will protect the, uh, the benefits that will protect the workers and uh, will actually uh, help them to survive Uh, during their employment and also about uh, uh, social some social security benefits which they might get after their retirement now dismantling of this labor law now what was the reason what was the uh, justification given by the uh, government given by niti ayog regarding this dismantling of labor law they said that the indian labor law is actually it has been discussed from decades that indian labor law is highly stringent it is old fashioned it is restrictive and there are presence of several structural bottlenecks which actually discourages investment in the indian economy and especially in the manufacturing sectors that is they said that the presence of this stringent law is hindering investment and growth in the indian economy especially in the manufacturing sector so this dismantling of the labor laws will first help to clear the structural bottlenecks of the labor market which is present uh, then it will help india to reap the advantages of disruptions in global supply chains now what has happened is that with the onset of the pandemic several foreign investors they were taking away their money from the chinese economy so indian government said that this is a very good chance very uh, golden chance for india to reap this advantage and attract those investors to our country by showing them that our labor market uh, reforms have we have done our labor market reforms and our labor market is fully conducive for investment so this was the second reason that they gave that to attract investment and they also said that this attract if they attract investment there will be generation of more employment opportunities and especially this will help the returning migrant workers who have returned to their native place and in search of and are in search of jobs in their native place so this will be very helpful for them moreover they said that there are inconsistency in the labor laws due to multiplicity due to overlapping uh, authorities so these all these things will be removed if there is dismantling of labor laws then it also said that drop down of this regulation that is the contract uh, labor regulation abolition act of 1970 would lead to the ease of replacing the permanent employees in the core and the perennial services of the manufacturing industry especially with the contractual labors which will make which will give the investors an incentive to do their production in a cost effective way so this cost of labor will be decreased and the investors they will find that it is a golden opportunity to invest in the manufacturing sectors of indian economy and to reap the benefits of the cheap labor so these were the justifications given by the government the central government and the niti ayog um, regarding their dismantling of the laws and obviously if these things happens if there is more employment opportunities especially for the returning migrant workers there will be obviously reduction in poverty okay now the question that arises is that is this dismantling of the labor law actually beneficial for indian economy so we have to uh, do an inspection we have to examine that actually whether this is a uh, uh, beneficial for indian economy or not 
So you can see this. These are the two uh, paper cuttings, uh, pictures of paper cutting, where it's one. The, this one says that the parliament, uh, the parliament passes the labor bills amid the boycott from its uh, opponent parties. So the labor laws, they are, these labor laws, uh, actually the labor laws have been uh, altered. They have been replaced by four labor codes, and these labor codes are passed in the parliament. And in the next one, you can see that the trade unions they have decided to go to a go on a strike. This is a paper of 15th May 2020 on uh, May 22nd to protest uh, protest against the labor law suspension because they have found that the new labor courts which have replaced the labor laws which have dismantled the existing labor laws they are uh, not beneficial for the working class. So. Just um, uh, to uh, go into the uh, uh, labor laws, we just uh, uh, for the students only. I have made this that you uh, need to know that actually there are two forms of labor laws in any country. The first one is the collective labor law, which deals with the relationship between the employer, the employee, and and the trade unions. And there are individual labor laws, which deals with the relation between the employer and the employee. And this does not consider the trade union. in terms of the bargain and all these things okay so the individual labor law they uh, it's an agreement between the employer and the individual employee whereas the collective uh, labor law which considers the trade union with them it is actually this laws regulates the wages the benefits the duties of the employees any type of dispute between the management and the company all this falls within this collective labor laws so we need to know that in india the labor law are a part of the concurrent list that is it has to be uh, when a labor law is to be implemented in the economy it has to get the uh, get the uh, grant or get the uh, permission of both the central government and also the uh, state governments have to pass the rules regarding that so there are a series of labor laws where you can see that uh, some laws are enacted and enforced by the central government directly some uh, of the laws are enacted by the central government but they are enforced by both the state and the central government jointly and there are certain uh, laws which are enacted by the central government but they are only enforced by the state government so these are the laws uh, this is only an uh, example this is not the exhaustive list because there are actually more than 52 federal um, central laws actually and 100 state enacted laws so i couldn't fit them all so this is just an example to show you that there are three forms of uh, labor laws where the central and the state they how they are enforcing them and who is uh, enacting them and who is enforcing them so there are three forms of laws okay now it is uh, actually it has been uh, there has been no Uh, dispute regarding the necessity of labor market reforms i repeat there is no dispute regarding the necessity of labor market reforms but there are two distinct views on that the first view says it's a pro employer view which says that the stringent labor laws are hindrance in the way of investment and industry friendly ambience the things the points which had been declared by the central government and the niti ayog those points those reasons are pro employer and there is a significantly distinct uh, different view which is a pro worker view they also say that yes there is a necessity of labor market reforms but the reforms the laws should be in such a way formed in such a way that they could synchronize the emerging casual and contractual nature of employment and they should also to ensure the basic rights of worker in both formal and informal sector because they said that actually it has been seen empirically that whenever you are going for a pro worker labor law reforms it actually at the end benefits the growth of the economy as well as the overall development of the economy because it enhances the labor productivity their satisfaction thus it actually stimulates the economic growth and also bring an ambience of overall development 
so there are two distinct views but it is uh, it is really sad to see that when these labor when our indian labor market was actually reformed the labor laws were reformed the highlight was actually given the significance was given to this portion the pro employer laws okay now the uh, central about all, approximately 29 central labor law have been replaced by labor codes these are the names the code on social security the uh, industrial relations code <coughs> sorry occupational safety health and working conditions code and the codes on wages okay these are the four labor codes that have been that has replaced 29 labor laws they had dismantled the 29 labor laws and they have come into force okay if we start with the industrial relations code then these are the three existing labor laws which has been replaced by the industrial relations code the trade union acts the industrial employment and standing order act the industrial dispute act and these are the salient features of the industrial relations code i will not go into the details due to lack of time but just see here look at this look at the second point it says that this industrial the industrial relations code introduces the fixed term employment okay this remember this fixed term employment which gives employer the flexibility to hire workers on a on the basis of requirement through a written contract actually this means that a fixed term employment actually means it is a contract with a uh, of the workers with the company where the employees are hired for a specific period of time and as soon as that uh, contract is ended they can be fired out okay so the uh, ease of hiring and firing employers uh, employees is being given in this industrial relations code and another thing is that that any establishment any uh, uh, institution or establishment that employs 300 or more workers must prepare standing order and they should make the government aware they should give a notice to the government saying that they are uh, hire they are firing out laborers or they are closing down but if an establishment has an employment less than 300 workers then they can do it very easily the terms and conditions for uh, firing out laborers for closer uh, of the institution or the establishment will be very easy if the number of employees are lower okay then uh then uh, this one look at this one the fourth one and the last one in this uh, uh, ppt the this uh, industrial relation code also prohibits strikes and lockouts in the industrial establishment without a prior notice of about 60 days before the strike or within 14 days of giving such a notice okay so there is a uh, vigilance that the government has put on the trade unions and have restricted them to make to call strikes and you know that calling strikes is one of the major ways of the trade unions of the working class to bargain for their benefits and income with the uh, employer class so there is a ban almost a ban has been put on the trade unions to call for strikes and this is the major thing this is so this one among all the labor codes that have been passed the four labor codes that has been passed the uh, trade unions are mostly opposing this one the industrial relations code 2020 okay this is the vital one which the trade unions are opposing okay then the next code is on the code on uh, social security and these it has uh, replaced all these acts which was present in the economy and uh, these are the salient features where a career uh, career center will be introduced where the uh, which will be actually a hub where the people who are searching for employment will be matched with the people who are trying to employ workers okay and they it also said that uh, so several social security schemes for the unorganized workers platform workers or gig workers and the, as well as their members of their families will be given uh, several benefits of the epf and then uh, the e uh, esic will be given to the uh, uh, workers it is uh, uh, the salient features of the social security code okay then uh, the next code is the code on wages 
and these are the four acts which has which it has replaced and these are if you go to the salient feature please look at this underlying uh, this this point look at this point that given a statutory uh, statutory force the there will be a national four level minimum wages which will be fixed by the central government and after the after obviously with the, the consultation with the state government but there is no clear mandate given to the employers asking them to pay at least the floor wages this is very important the government is fixing floor wages but there is no mandate given in the code which um, uh, have, which makes it mandatory for the employers to pay them at least the floor wages and it is said that the minimum wages will be revised uh, over within 5 years and it should not exceed 5 years then it says that equal wages to all genders and then employers are mandated to fix a 50% of wages as their basic and dearness allowance retaining allowance etc so these are the features and the last quote is about the occupational safety uh, health and working conditions code 2020 and these are the uh, existing labor laws which this code has replaced and these are the salient features it uh, says that uh, there should be free annual health examination there should be maintenance and uh, safety nets for the uh, safety uh, situation safety working safe uh, working in uh, working environment for the employer employees and there should be no ch uh, charge levied on the employing for the maintenance of safety and health at the workplace and so on so how does this four codes affect the employers as you can see in your screen the list of advantages is so many and there is only one disadvantage and even this advantage this disadvantage is actually the disadvantage which the employers are telling it is not uh, not nothing so very significant so among the advantage the, the, you can understand that they have the uh, easiness to hire and fire their workers they have they have reduced compliance burden they can uh, they have uh, now they have the power uh, to hold on the strikes wage determination is mostly in the hand of the employers uh, then the uh, it will be it will become more cost effective for them to do production and only disadvantage that the employers have pointed out is that uh, the, there is a significant um, uh, that 50% see look here uh, in this one just a minute yes this one the employers in the code of uh, code on wages there is a 50% uh, the employers are mandated to fix a 50% wage as basic and dearness allowance okay so they are saying that if uh, this um, point will actually lead to a higher wage burden on them in certain cases so they are on their the only disadvantages from the point of the employers is, is this one that the that wage code might lead to a higher wage burden on the employers okay now how this codes will affect the workers so uh, just like just opposite to the previous slide here the list of advantages containing only one point and the disadvantage is so high uh the for the disadvantages you know the first one is that uh, there will be an extension of the working hours from 8 hours to 12 hours 8 hours has been uh, many you know that uh, the it is a standard working hour 8 hours but it will be now extended to 12 hours the extension of the fixed term labor contracts which we discussed without legal backing okay with uh, legal, with legal backing sorry it will be uh, it will give the full power to the employer to hire and fire the people uh, whenever they want okay uh, then it will be become uh, it will become harder for the um, uh, uh, working class to negotiate regarding their benefits wages with the working class the strikes will be uh, calling strikes will have become almost impossible the only advantage is that there is a, a clause that whenever uh, someone is going out of the industry he is fired or he is leaving our uh, establishment the fire or he is um, actually retiring from there the faster full and final settlement of payment compensation would be there so these are the uh, highlights you remember in the i showed you i have shown you a slide where it said that the trade union they are wanting to go to a strike uh, uh, against this labor laws and these are the things which the trade union these are the points which the trade unions have uh, risen that they have said that these are the reasons that's why we are not supporting this labor laws and we want withdrawal of them okay now if we look and to look into the state level scenario the state the state of uttar pradesh actually they were very encouraged with this labor codes and uh, they uh, uh, 
started with there they actually established their uttar pradesh temporary exemption from certain labor laws ordinance 2020 which says that all labor laws related to labor unions settling work disputes and regulation of working class all will be dismantled suspended for three years okay and these are the clause these are the important clause that they have suspended just look at them the minimum wage act the maternity benefit act the equal remuneration act the trade union act the uh, industrial employment act the industrial dispute act and the factories act the more the Im most important acts which actually look at the benefit of the working class have been dismantled for three years Okay, and the other states like Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Orissa, Gujarat, and Uttarakhand, they are also likely to follow you know, Uttar Pradesh soon. But most of the state governments uh, have not uh, implemented the laws till now because they are saying that it is an emergency which is going on regarding the crisis, COVID crisis, and it is not a good time to implement these laws. Okay, so the, uh, if we come to the initiatives that have been taken by the central government, these are the two main initiatives. One is the announcement of the Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Yojana Avian, where uh, such a huge amount of uh, have, amount have been sanctioned for job schemes for the migrant workers in six states. Uh, and then there is a launching of the Ishram portal and the creation of a national database for the unorganized workers for maintaining a single point reference of these workers so that the central government or the state government can give out some benefits, uh, some relief measures to this uh, unorganized workers when there is some uh, crisis. So these are the major initiatives taken by the central government to tackle the situation. Okay. Now, you have to remember something that whatever labor laws that we have discussed uh, just now for the last 15-20 uh, minutes, actually these labor laws, they mainly are levied on the workers in the formal sector because the workers in the informal sector, actually, they are devoid of this labor laws. Because by the definition only, the, uh, the this informal workers, they don't fall under those labor laws. The workers who fa fall under the labor laws will uh, face those difficulties. The regular salary, which we have taken as the formal sector, okay, that formal employment, those formally employed workers, they will face the burden of the new labor codes. See, the unorganized workers, the informal workers were already devoid of these laws. They were facing difficulties because they were not coming under those laws which actually uh, protected, the benefited the workers. Only the formal sector workers came under those laws. Now the formal sector workers are also devoid of those laws. These laws have been dismantled. The labor codes, as you have, as we have discussed, is mostly pro-employer type, which is not looking at the betterment of the working class in a significant way. So uh, if we look at the unorganized workers, that is the informal workers, if we look at them, then there is actually an act which is called the Unorganized Workers Social Security Act 2008, which actually uh, aims to give some social benefits uh, to bring the organized workers into social safety nets. And these are the schemes which comes under this uh, Unorganized Workers Social Security Act. You can have a look. Um, okay, so these are the uh, so schemes which uh, makes the which are given to the um, unorganized or the informal workers uh, so that they also can come under the Social Security Act. Now, given that already the uh, labor laws which were protecting the rights of the um, formal workers have been dismantled already. We don't know what will be the fate of such uh, unorganized workers social uh, security act. It is uh, under the government. It is a scheme of the government. So hopefully this will continue. Okay, so we uh, come to our conclusion that uh, we already have seen that Indian economy is characterized by a condition of jobless growth uh, throughout the post-reforms era. And we have already seen that there is a huge rise in the unemployment. There is a decrease in the workforce participation rate, especially for the females. There is a presence of ext extensive informal sector coupled with a very small proportion of formal employment. And the COVID-19 pandemic 
actually have aggravated this distressed condition of our uh, economy and it has led to huge loss of job decline of income pay cut unsecured insecurity etc and so in order to boost the employment as the uh, central government said they thought that one way to boost employment one way to bring back the economy into track is to attract the investors into the manufacturing sectors into the indian economy and this could be done only by dismantling the laws the existing laws which are very stringent according to them very stringent very old fashioned and so they wanted to uh, replace those labor laws with four labor codes which are simplified which will bring consistency in overlapping laws which will boost in boost investment and also raise the employment opportunities and hence will reduce poverty now the uh, uh, although these are uh, just just this the things have been said by the just this justification has been given by the central government uh, the trade union the labor activists the economists have criticized them they criticized this code especially the uh, one the industrial relations code especially that one has been mostly criticized and because they have thought that this type of codes this type of clause uh the harmful it will actually harm the workers in long run and uh, because uh, the economist has also argued that uh, em no empirical evidence of a significant uh, positive correlation between the uh, dismantling of labor's law and increase of uh, economic growth have been seen anywhere in the economy they said that there is actually no significant bringing the uh, working class into a a floor level and uh, the boost in the economy there is no such positive relationship no significant relationship nowhere in the world it has been found to be such rather they have shown that there are certain evidences there are quite a evidence so evidences across the globe where it has been seen that the labor reforms which are pro worker they have raised the productivity of the workers and have actually brought an economic growth along with an overall ambience of development and finally this sorry mere creation of this portal ishram portal or a database own to be enough actual implementation of various schemes and to keep a strict vigilance that whether these schemes are actually working or not whether these benefits are actually reaching the grassroots level workers or not that is very important so the vigilance from the government not only implementation but a strict vigilance from the government is necessary to make the working the platform of any economy they make the platform of any economy they have to be kept uh, they have to actually they are uh, if they are not satisfied if they are exploited an economy cannot sustain its economic growth and development so uh, i end my lecture here thank you thank you very much am i audible hello yes, yeah yes, so uh, yes. uh sincere thanks to dr atri pal for taking us through this very thought provoking and informative journey about a section of our society who have been the most affected during this lockdown process highlighting their plight and providing us with an assessment of the possible impact of the proposed labor laws on them our next speaker dr shurojit dash is assistant professor of economics from the center of economic studies and planning in jnu and someone whose research works have been read by most of us in various epw articles since his days at the nipfp as economist he has researched extensively on macroeconomic policy making and has also worked in developing human development indices as well as cge models for india in uh, indian planning commission in the 12th finance commission of india as well as the state planning board of kerala his areas of interest are varied and include macroeconomic and policy public finance human development and applied econometrics here to discuss the macroeconomics of policy making during the exceptional situation of a pandemic related lockdown we invite dr shurojit das to share his insights and expert knowledge with us you may please begin now dr das 
thanks a lot <coughs> um, um, at the outset i must thank uh, barashad government college and bidan nagar college for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to interact with the students and also uh, to share some of my thoughts uh, so um, uh, i mean in particular i must thank professor tina barma i mean we were batchmates in jnu so uh, i mean because of her i am here so i am really grateful to you tina uh, let me uh, begin how much time do i have uh, around 45 minutes or so yes shudojit yes and uh, uh, the uh, i mean audience is mostly students right uh, yes <laughs> okay great excellent uh, so uh, i mean if there are faculty members respected faculty members uh, respected my previous speaker uh, professor afrai pal and uh, Uh, my student friends uh, uh, i mean we all know uh, that it is a difficult time not only for our economy but uh, for the world economy as a whole because of the uh, covid 19 induced lockdown and the disruption of economic activities because of that i am trying to share my screen Uh, I don't know whether it is visible or not. Uh, yes, it is visible, Shurojit. Okay, uh, we can okay. all see. Excellent. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, I don't have too many slides, but uh, this particular slide I was I prepared for uh, one conference organized by Bengal Economic Association three four days back, and there I was uh, making a presentation. so these slides are prepared for that i thought uh, i'll share some of these slides with the students today as well uh okay great yeah so uh uh this particular presentation is called in fact i was writing one book chapter Uh, on this particular topic some aspects of impact of lockdown in india and the way forward now uh uh you know it was uh, extremely depressing we were carrying out some primary survey in eight in 15 states in india right from uh, kerala telangana uh, then odisha uh, then bengal then assam then uh, meghalaya ladakh uh, then uh, uttar pradesh bihar uh, rajasthan haryana uh, delhi uh, and uh, so on so forth okay i may have missed one or two states names but basically 15 states initially uh, i mean throughout this pandemic year of 2020 21 and uh, initially we were conducting telephonic surveys because it was not possible to go to those states physically for primary surveys but uh, personally i could go to two states goa goa i missed out goa and assam for primary survey to get the feel of the situation at the ground level and uh, their situation was so bizarre we were trying to contact primarily Uh, people who are engaged in unorganized informal sector of the economy i mean uh, given the character of indian economy you must be knowing that most of the workforce uh, is employed in unorganized informal sector in our economy uh, so we were basically contacting also I mean, people from all sorts of professions from uh, i mean somewhere from formal sector also teachers bankers and uh, so on and so forth government employees and other private sector corporate sector employees but most of our respondents were uh, from unorganized informal sector maybe uh, from tourism sector in goa i was uh, thinking uh, then uh, carpenters your ac mechanic your electricians gardeners your domestic help your Uh, rickshaw pullers vegetable vendors auto driver taxi drivers uh, you know uh, i mean chicken and fish sellers and and so on so forth so 
uh, we could talk to total 3142 people and uh, we have got information about their family members the entire family so that way we have got information about almost uh, 15000 people 14400 uh, something around 14500 people and uh, the surveys were conducted uh, in different months starting from 2020 uh, lockdown was imposed in march end uh, we started these surveys from june and we continued these surveys up to 2021 january so during this period we were in various months we surveyed various states with the help of a lot of my friends because i can't speak so many languages so uh, they have actually spoken to the people and provided me the data now uh, situation of course varied widely state to state lockdown was imposed in different degrees in different states in different time periods so it was not uniform at all the reach of the government uh, policies were also widely varied uh, across the states in india if we summarize uh, the i don't want to talk too much about this because i have other things to talk about today so uh, if we summarize the uh, result survey result it looks like this uh, you know, as I have already mentioned, that uh, total 3,142 households were covered, including, uh, I mean, consisting of 14,472 people from 15 states in India. Now, almost 50% of the respondents have reported absolutely zero income during the lockdown. I mean, from whom we have got the information about their personal income. So almost 50% of the respondents have said in our sample, this sample may not be representative sample for the entire country. But uh, I mean, as far as our sample is concerned, it throws some light on the ground level situation, may not be necessarily uh, representative. But uh, in our sample, 50% uh, people lost their income completely during lockdown. The average income of these respondents came down by 61%, that is more than 60% due to the lockdown. The average income of all the respondents, taking 50% lost their entire income, and others have also lost their income significantly. If we take the average of all the people, all the respondents, the average income loss was more than 60% as compared to what they used to earn before lockdown. So almost 50%, 46.7% of families for which the information was available uh, reported zero income during the lockdown. You know, 50% respondents and 46.7% uh, families. So it's almost the same. Almost 50% respondents again have reported increase in their indebtedness. That is, uh, they could not manage with their past saving, their income uh, came down drastically or they started earning zero income uh, at the same time their consumption expenditure could not come down proportionately because they had to uh, spend on necessities like house rent or uh, food and so on and so forth sometimes health expenditures so their consumption expenditure could not come down proportionately and as a result of that some could manage with their past savings and 46 percent of the respondents have uh, i mean 50 percent of the respondents have said that they had to borrow money either from their i mean friends or family members or relatives or neighbors or some people got indirectly indebted they could not pay house rent in time they have taken uh, commodities from the nearest grocery stores but could not pay the bill and so on and so forth so 50% respondents have reported that they have become indebted. 46% of the respondents suspected that their expected future income in next six months would be less than 40% of their pre-lockdown income. That is, we were asking them that, uh, I mean, what is your expected income once the lockdown uh, would get over, once the economy would open up? What do you think? How much would you... Uh, earn then so uh, the situation was such that uh, that uh, you know their expectations were also so low 
that they were expecting that even if lockdown gets over probably they would be earning only uh, uh, 40% of what on an average what they used to earn earlier so uh, i mean the situation was pretty depressing and all the people we have met were very depressed i can give you extreme examples but i don't want to uh, give those extreme examples I, I actually i have met somebody in assam personally who seriously thought of committing suicide and i have in my life i have met only one person till date who actually seriously considered of uh, committing suicide uh, but um, you know he wanted a bank loan of 3 lakh rupees he has a small shop of bedding and all this uh, pillow etc in uh, one of these markets in guwahati and he um, uh, i mean was opening the shop but there was no customer there was no demand so you know uh, it is important to remember that most of our workforce in fact more than 50% of our total workforce uh, is self employed self employed means they run their own shops they run their own auto rickshaw they have their own small business and they are running so so their profit is equal to their income that is the definition of self employment and uh, our salaried employees are just uh, less than 25% of the total workforce uh the rest are casual and contractual workers okay that is the broad picture of workforce in india so uh, i think professor atri pal was also mentioning that uh, uh, the situation is precarious at the ground level uh, as far as employment is concerned uh, uh more than two third of respondents have said that there is a definitely need for universal employment guarantee program that is we have this uh, mg nrgs program but it gives some kind of employment guarantee that to only in the rural areas but urban unemployment has also increased enormously due to the lockdown so uh, there was a, a huge demand uh, more than two third of our respondents and one third respondents may be there from rural areas so they already have it uh, but at least two third of the respondents in our sample have said that that the employment guarantee program must be made universal not only for the rural areas but also for the urban areas 72% families have got some ration okay uh, professor atri pal was mentioning about uh, pradhan mantri garib kalyan yojana in under that uh, scheme initially which became eventually part of the atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan package but initially the government central government announced that 5 kg per head uh, rice or wheat and uh, some dal per family 1 kg of dal per family per month uh, would be distributed freely through fair price shops and uh, uh, there would be some free gas cylinders for the uh, poorer section of population and some money in their jandhan account uh, uh, would be uh, given by the central government but um, you know but i mean when we were surveying in 15 states in india to get an overall uh, picture of the country i mean it varies widely state to state as far as the implementation of same government scheme is concerned because coverage of fair price shop ration shops are not equally good everywhere many people for example we were surveying in sikkim uh, in sikkim people have reported that the nearest ration shop is uh, some uh, and it is a hilly state so nearest ration shop is around 40 kilometers away from their home so under lockdown how would they go uh, for, to, for the fair price shop which is 40 kilometers away and get free ration from there it was impossible okay and uh, uh, some states where uh, coverage of these things are uh, for example kerala etc uh, many people almost uh, everybody has reported that they have got some free ration so we are asking people who have you got some free ration during lockdown as promised by the government 72% families overall in in 15 states have said that they have got some free ration maybe less than lower than entitlement etc but at least they have got some free ration okay and 72% is not uh, a bad coverage given the fact that in many states the coverage of ration free price shops uh, is not really very good and the functioning of the uh, public distribution system is not very good 25% uh, have received some money in jandhan account 
only 25% of the respondents have reported that in their family somebody has got some money may not be 500 rupees in every month but at least once or twice or thrice they have received some money in jamdan account but many states i mean they i mean people are unaware of existence of this jamdan account they don't even know that there is something called jamdan account so number of jamdan accounts were very low in those states some states have done relatively better than the other and so on and only 23% have received at least one gas cylinder during the lockdown and that also varies widely state to state in some states nobody has reported that they have received a uh, free gas cylinder in some states i mean uh, more than 23% people have received gas cylinders and so on so this was the ground level situation during 202021 uh, as far as our survey data is concerned is there any question as of now please feel free to ask you know it's for your benefit i mean uh, am i going yeah yeah shuru ji actually we'll have the question answer session after your uh, speech okay. Okay. so it will be a common question answer session I so see. the students have been putting in a number of questions queries okay. Okay. we'll get to that after you finish all right okay thanks uh all right then uh, uh, as professor apripal was uh, suggesting that uh, there is no uh, reliable data uh, as of now on overall aggregate unemployment situation in the country but we have periodic labor force surveys nowadays and the latest survey data has come out recently this is on 2019 20 but our economic year is up to uh, the month of march it is april to march but uh, as far as uh, periodic labor force for survey data is concerned their data starts from july and ends in june so that way 2019 20 data covers the first quarter of lockdown period that is the months of april may and june 2020 that data has been reported in uh, 2000 plfs 2019-20 data if we look at the annual unemployment rate annual unemployment rate as far as 2018-19 unemployment uh, periodic labor force date survey data was concerned the unemployment rate was around 6% okay 5.83% and uh, uh, this data shows that unemployment rate has actually come down annual unemployment rate has actually come down including the first quarter of the lockdown period to around 4% but we have to as far as the report is concerned but we have to look into little detail of this data if you look at the unit level data that is they collect data from you know a uh, lot of people uh, more than 1 lakh people so Uh, if we look at the unit level data and that too for the last quarter that is for the months of april may and june then and also if we incorporate they have a definition called somebody is employed with zero income okay now if we add that that category that is those who are looking to be looking like employed but they have earned zero income so employed with zero income I mean, for all practical purposes, basically they were unemployed. As I was saying, that uh, you know, for self-employed people, if uh, they don't earn anything in their own businesses, then that is equivalent to unemployment. So, uh, people employed with zero income plus people who were involuntarily unemployed. If we uh, only in the fourth quarter of PLFS 2019-20 data, that is for the quarter of April, May, and June. I mean, for the quarter, first quarter of 2000 economic year 2020-21, we see that unemployment rate increased to almost 30 percent. Okay, during that quarter, and which is not unexpected because if you remember the GDP growth, of course, provisional estimate, the GDP growth, quarterly GDP growth in that quarter, the first quarter of 2020-21. was minus 24% and uh, on top of that already existing unemployment rate was around 6% so uh, 
so 24 plus 6 is equal to 30 percent okay so uh, one would expect that uh, probably the unemployment would rise to 30 percent in the at least in the first quarter of the lockdown but for the entire year 2021 we don't have unemployment data yet we have done some calculation if there are questions i can explain but uh, what we have done is we have taken the unemployment uh, data state wise sector wise for eight major sectors of the economy we have taken unemployment uh, rates from 2018-19 periodic labor force survey data and uh, we have got the provisional estimates of gdp for the year 2020-21 the actual data is yet to come but provisional estimates are there sector wise so we have applied these growth rates on that data and assume that generally you know year to year every year the labor sectoral average labor productivity that is par uh, head output uh, sectoral output generally generally it grows every year but uh, even if we assume that it remains the same if it grows then unemployment would be even higher but even if we assume that within one year sectoral average labor productivity did not did not change much uh, in uh, under that assumption the fall sectoral uh, fall in sectoral you know gdp growth rate uh, would be equal to fall in uh, sectoral employment opportunities so that way we tried to calculate for the entire year 2020-21, what would be the likely unemployment rate? And according to our calculation, with agriculture, the unemployment rate probably would be 10.87%, almost 11%. And if we leave aside agriculture, there is a reason to leave aside agricultural sector because agricultural growth rate has been assumed to be almost 3.5%, which is from the productivity data actual data on agricultural sector is yet to come for the year 2020-21 when it arrives we have to see what has been the actual growth rate more importantly agriculture is a residual sector in our economy many people including professor amartya sen have been as mentioned that uh, you know uh, uh, there could be a lot of disguised unemployment in agricultural sector because Atreipal was talking about migrant laborers when they go back to their villages and if they don't get any other employment opportunity, probably they would also uh, start doing some agricultural activity. But that is not uh, uh, employment opportunity in true sense. It's basically disguised unemployment. Uh, so if we leave as because of this reason, if we leave aside agricultural sector, then the expected unemployment rate in the year 2020-21 would be 12.3 percent which is more than 12 percent unemployment double digit figure as uh, compared to 5.83 percent which was the existing unemployment rate so unemployment rate is likely to be at least doubled at least doubled in the year 2020-21 as a result of covid 19 induced lockdown in india uh, then we conducted another survey, which was Google form based survey. You know, Google form based surveys have some limitations. That is, those who are uh, comfortable with internet and English language, etc., they only can fill these Google forms. And uh, I mean, in rural areas where internet connectivity is not that good or people are not very comfortable in English and uh you know uh, uh, they are not very regular in internet using internet etc for them uh, this kind of surveys are not applicable so here and also there is a class perspective that uh, a particular section of middle class uh, can fill these google forms and not all sections of the population so our target group for this survey was basically uh, the middle class upper middle class people in and around delhi uh, whose uh, monthly family average monthly family income is around two and a half lakh rupees. Okay, so those families who are earning two and a half lakh rupees, we have surveyed only that class through this Google form based surveys to understand the fall in demand in different sectors of consumer durables like automobiles, 
फार्निचार इलेक्ट्रनिक आईटेम प्रपार्टी फ्लैट हाउसेस एटसेट्रा दे आर इनमेंट इन दैट travel within india domestic travel whether they had a plan of traveling within india within this year of 2020 2021 and they have postponed these plans by 3 months 6 months 1 year more than 1 year or they could materialize the plan um, as uh, it was planned earlier whether they had any plan of major surgery in their family of any family member whether there was a plan of family get together celebration of marriage or you know birthday or some anniversary etc uh, whether the, these plans have been postponed or not so uh, if we summarize the observation we can see that almost uh, you know one third to two third uh, plans got postponed by it varies sector to sector uh, by one year or more within parenthesis these numbers are basically percentages i mean total sample size here for this survey was 501 so uh, out of that 500 people how many had demands for i mean plans for these purchasing these commodity consumer durables and um, uh, what proportion of them uh, had to postpone the plan because of lockdown by 3 months by 6 months by 1 year and more than 1 year and so on so uh, here we have seen that they i mean more than uh, one third of the plans at least one third of the plans have been postponed by uh, one year or more so that means uh, these industries would also lose demand at least by one third or more during the lockdown year and those who are employed in these industries they their employment opportunities would also shrink and more importantly the multipliers that those who are uh, uh, employed in these uh, uh, industries they would lo- lose their income or job and as a result of that they spend that money their income on some other commodities so demand for those uh, sectors would also come down so that way a negative multiplier you must be aware of uh, keynesian multiplier so negative multiplier would start working okay now uh, as far as the fiscal situation is concerned in uh, 2021 22 budget we have got the revised estimate for 2020 21 and it shows that the fiscal deficit as a proportion of gdp for the union government alone uh, it is almost 9.3% of gdp okay we know that gdp shrunk by uh, 7.3% uh, in that particular year as compared to the previous year and uh, now the first quarter uh, growth rate data is also out so first quarter growth rate uh, shows that the growth rate has been lower than the negative growth rate in absolute term the negative growth rate of last year that means the first quarter of 2021 22 gdp is still lower than what it was in the first quarter of 2019 20 okay so uh, i mean till now growth is not even zero it is still negative uh, so that is the situation and uh, as a result of this negative growth rate the revenue receipt of the government suffered drastically and because of this uh, revenue shortfall both in direct taxes as well as in indirect taxes i mean direct taxes come from mainly profit and income now profit of people have also fallen because of lack of demand in the market and uh, uh, income of people have also fallen because of loss in uh, job or pay cuts or uh, you know uh, lack of uh, uh, demand in the market and uh, as a result of that the direct tax revenues have suffered badly as far as indirect tax revenues are concerned they come from the consumption expenditure of people and uh, also to some extent uh, uh, i mean import duty and so on but uh, import has also uh, come down because if gdp growth comes down then as a function of that import growth also comes down as so uh, as a function of that the import duty earning of government also suffers and uh, as people's income suffered consumption suffered because of that tax on consumption also suffered so indirect taxes have also suffered 
As a result of that, there was huge revenue shortfall of the union government. We are yet to know the state government figures. But for state governments, also the fiscal deficit in 2020-21 is likely to be at least 4% of GDP, taking all the states together. So 4% plus 9.5% would be around 13.5% of GDP, which is likely the likely figure for the combined fiscal deficit to GDP ratio for the year 2020-21, which is quite high. Okay. Now, uh, given this, uh, the government, that's why government is showing desperation for, you know, disinvestment. They have planned for almost 1%, 1 percent, 1,75,000 crore rupees of disinvestment within the year 2021-22. Now there is this uh, um, plan, Planning Commission, Niti Ayog has come out with this brochure that um, this uh, asset monetization pipeline, they are calling it. So they are expecting that uh, they would be able to uh, earn 6 lakh crore rupees, which is around 3% of GDP from asset monetization and so on and so forth. There are a lot of protests against that, against that which is going on. Uh, there are moral ethical questions, the assets which have been accumulated over time using past generations taxpayers' money, whether the present government has the right moral authority to, to sell those assets uh, either forever or they will now they are saying that they will give in long term lease for uh, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 90 years for some assets, 99 years. Nobody knows. But uh, government is showing this desperation because of the fact that government is unable to meet its expenditures. Government on record has said to the, the union government has said to the state governments that. Uh, they are not in a position to pay the GST compensations to the states. They could not pay the uh, dearness allowance areas to its own employees, government employees, and so on and so forth because of the uh, huge revenue shortfall. So government are, is under huge stress. So uh, that is the fiscal situation overall. However, the point is that if under this condition, the, if the government cuts down its expenditure, which has been proposed in the budget, two percentage point of GDP amount of cutting down the aggregate expenditure of the union government alone, then that also would have some negative multiplier effect. And that way growth rate would take longer time to recover. And if growth rate takes longer time to recover, then obviously government revenues would also suffer for a longer time. And fis future fiscal deficit to GDP ratio would also not uh, come down in near future if government shows some kind of fiscal conservatism. So this was the overall broad picture of the public finance during 2020-21 till now. Now I want to draw your attention to two more graphs uh, very uh, uh, quickly. One is uh, this credit deposit ratio. Uh, you know what is the of, of all commercial banks in India taken together. What is credit deposit ratio? We all uh, have some savings in the banks. So uh, banks, that is called a deposit base of the bank. And investors, for investment, for making investment, they borrow money from uh, the commercial banks. And uh, that is called credit. Okay. So this credit to deposit ratio, which was more than 78% before the lockdown, this upper panel, uh, which started coming down this is the data from 27th march this is 20, 20 sorry 27th march it started coming down from 76 percent over 76 percent to less than 72 percent in 29th september 2020 then it remained more or less there uh, within so 72 73 percent up to 2021 march and then again it has started falling okay and this is the opposite graph that is uh, the uh, investment of commercial banks in government and securities and other approved securities. That is the counterpart of it, which has got, which was, this is according to the secondary axis, which was around 35%, which has gone up beyond 43%. It came down in between, but again, it has touched around 43%. So 43% of the deposit is being kept in government securities and other securities, approved securities by the commercial banks in India. 
and uh, this is happening because there is a huge fall in the demand for credit in the market investors are thinking that this is not the right time to invest market is down so they want to wait and watch and they are not demanding credit from the commercial banks for making investment however it is important to mention in this context that this atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan package you know it was almost uh, 10% of gdp amount of package 20 lakh crore 21 lakh crore amount of package but more than 75% of the package was not i mean the direct government expenditure or promised expenditure was around only 1% of gdp or so but 75% of the package was all about encouraging credit at easier terms and conditions particularly to the small and medium enterprises and also after changing the definition and also to the farmers and so on and so forth and also to the industrialists at easier terms and there were some measures taken by the reserve bank of india for liquidity infusion in the commercial banks and other term lending institutions in the country so it's basically for credit despite all those measures uh, your credit deposit ratio if we look at that is not improving at all in fact that is continuously falling and that remained uh, low and now of late it is showing even higher falling tendencies so this is that means i mean since there is no demand in the market therefore there is no profitable opportunity in the market therefore the at aggregate level at least uh, the demand for investment demand or demand for credit is not picking up as compared to the deposit rate in india the other thing which i want to uh, draw your attention to is the india's foreign exchange reserve today i was checking uh, it is around uh, i think uh, 642 billion dollars or something around in terms of rupees crore it is around um, 46 uh, lakh or for almost 47 lakh crore rupees which means it is almost 24% of our gdp okay this is an idle balance it has grown these columns show the foreign exchange reserve of reserve bank of india in the date it i have started plotting it from 20th march 2020 and the last date is 2nd july 2021 okay and today it is almost 24% of our gdp in terms of rupees and more than 642 billion dollars which is huge amount of money which is sitting in the asset side of the uh, balance sheet of reserve bank of india today and uh, uh, it is idle balance because it does not fetch any return or any significant return but it is sitting there uh, and this has primarily happened because of uh, huge money flow foreign money flow in terms of foreign direct and portfolio investment this uh, and it has primarily come to our share market so if we plot the bse sensex during that time this black line diagram is showing the movement in bse sensex bombay stock exchange sensex okay so that is continuously showing an upward trend it is plotted along the secondary axis and it has increased from around 30000 to around uh, more than 50000 now okay so uh, when the economy was going down when employment situation was precarious when poverty was increasing when growth rate was negative when uh, you know consumption demand was extremely low tax revenues of the government low bse sensex was continuously growing and this foreign exchange reserve of the ba- uh, reserve bank of india was continuously growing so now uh, the last point which i want to mention that uh, if the government has to spend some money and if the government revenues are suffering because of the uh, demand depression uh, in the economy then government probably can make use of part of this huge foreign exchange reserve which is sitting idle in order to finance part of its expenditure and instead of uh, you know uh, following fiscal conservatism now because if you follow fiscal conservatism if you uh, want to lower your expenditure today uh, given the revenue shortfall then there would be negative multiplier effect and the economy would take long time to recover 
the unemployment situation would become normal after a long time and so people would suffer like anything etc so uh, government has to yes tina are you saying something no no sorry please continue okay uh, so i'll finish within 2 minutes maybe so uh, it's okay so uh, mm, uh, uh, yeah so uh, the if you know uh, so so uh, what are the areas uh, if we have to know that uh, where government should focus i would uh, like to argue that uh, number one is health this is a health crisis and uh, this uh, pandemic has shown us this covid crisis has shown us that 80% of our population cannot afford to go to these private uh, medical uh, facilities and hospitals for all practical purposes because they were charging exorbitantly high and there is absolutely no government control nothing so whatever and it was so intransparent because during covid in covid in case of covid you can't even enter the hospital you have to wait outside whatever bill they tell you you have to pay that otherwise you know they would not uh, release the patient and so on and so forth so um, 80% of our population whatever be the poverty line be it rural or urban 80 for all practical purposes 75 to 80% of our population is poor in this country and uh, the, the the you know inadequacy of government health facilities in the country was so stark during the uh, this uh, health crisis so government in india including state governments and central government they spend less than 1% of gdp on health uh, in in this country and out of pocket expenditure on health is one of the highest in this country i was looking at the data of more than uh, 175 countries around the world there are hardly 10 12 countries you will get where government expenditure to i mean government expenditure on health to gdp ratio combined government expenditure of state and central government uh, on health to the gdp ratio is this low the entire world uh, is spending at least two to three percent on health and many countries the developed world is spending seven eight nine percent on health so health has been neglected thoroughly by this country in fact i remember in 2004 there was this national common minimum program where it was drafted and the plan to uh, take the health expenditure up to three percent of gdp in this country i was looking at data again in china during 2000 the health expenditure to gdp ratio was around one percent but gradually now they have increased it to more than three percent but that time we were less than one percent even today we are less than one percent and even after this huge health crisis and so many deaths and so many uh, you know uh, sad things uh, there is hardly any uh, solid initiative uh, visible from the government part to expand health expenditure substantially in this country. So that is one area where government should spend. The second area is, of course, this uh, poverty alleviation and employment generation. I mean, the key to employment generation is, of course, boosting demand through Keynesian demand management policy or through expansionary fiscal policy at aggregate level. But until and unless that is happening, until and unless this unemployment crisis is on, uh, I think this uh, it is absolutely essential to universalize this, um, I mean, employment guarantee program or employment of last resort program. And the wage rate, average wage rate under that is just 202 rupees per day, which should be enhanced to at least to the minimum wage norm, which varies state to state, but according to the state's minimum wage norms, uh, which is around 350 to 400 rupees, uh, which varies state to state. In Kerala, it is higher. So it should be made at par with that. So these are two key areas where government must enhance uh, its expenditure, along with maintaining expenditures in other sectors. These are priorities. That's what I was trying to mention. So and uh, in order to finance that, uh, government's tax revenue may not recover even in this fiscal year. So uh, in order to finance that, instead of mindless disinvestment and uh, showing desperation for asset monetization, et cetera, uh, government may use this idle money which is sitting in RBI in terms of uh, excess idle foreign exchange reserve. Uh, that probably, that has been accumulated over time in order to manage the exchange rate. Otherwise, exchange rate would have been appreciated and 
your net export would have suffered even more so uh, that can part of that at least can easily be used uh, in order to finance that extra government expenditure so i would stop by uh, saying that probably this is not the time for fiscal conservatism government uh, uh, is showing tendencies for fiscal conservatism and cutting down expenditures in fact uh, government should do just the opposite that uh, government should go for expansionary demand management gainesian demand management policy in order to generate employment and output and to ensure faster recovery in the economy otherwise uh, recovery would be uh, prolonged uh, and the process of recovery would be prolonged and people would suffer in between and even government expenditure would also suffer and until and unless people would have purchasing power and meaningful employment in their hand they cannot uh, demand for commodities and services until and unless that picks up neither the government revenue would improve nor from businessman's point of view the investment would be profitable and until and unless investment becomes profitable private investment would not take place uh, at a faster rate and credit deposit ratio also would not improve and as a result of that your growth rate your employment generation everything would be slowed down so uh, there is another uh, probably avenue through which economies can grow fast at a faster rate that is called export led growth but since it was a pandemic it was uh, our export destinations also suffered equally badly so i don't see much possibility of export led growth right now so it has to be it has to be necessarily uh, fiscal policy led growth now under a situation of severe demand depression as we have seen earlier in this presentation uh, so uh, i mean to recover i think the key is to generate demand and demand generating demand through enhanced purchasing power of people in the country and for that government must step in and government must step in in much more serious manner in much more proactive manner than what it is i mean by government i am not talking about only union government union government state governments and local body governments all three tiers of government taken together uh, they must play a proactive role much more serious role you know government is in a denial they are showing uh, this cmi uh, data which is heavily biased their sample frame is not clear they are heavily biased in favor of the salaried employees and salaried employees are just uh, less than 25% of the total workforce so uh, by showing that data they are saying that unemployment has not increased much it increased only in two months two three months otherwise it's more or less equal to what it was uh, according to their data what it was before lockdown so government is not even officially acknowledging that there has been huge rise in unemployment and huge loss in income of people and uh, uh, loss in purchasing power of power of people which led to this uh, demand crisis not only in this country all over the world and all over the governments all over the world should go for uh expansionary demand management policy in my opinion rather than um, showing conservative tendencies under this current, uh, current crisis on the face of uh revenue loss this crisis should be taken in the history i think this kind of negative shock is quite unprecedented some people were initially comparing it with the depression of interwar period now it is uh, looking like the data is yet to come from uh, all the developing countries but it is lo looking like it is much more severe even than that as compared to that uh, the uh, I mean, size of the fiscal stimulus or fiscal intervention or uh, uh, you know uh, the, the kind of uh, concerted efforts we have witnessed after the financial crisis of 2008 uh, us financial crisis even uh, it is not visible even at that scale so it's quite unfortunate people are suffering badly but uh, uh, government uh, i think uh, should should uh, play a proactive role sooner than the later and i think demand side economists should be given a patient hearing uh, under this crisis in order to overcome and get rid of uh, this vicious trap demand trap which i was talking about uh, sooner than the later thank you thank you very much thank you for your patience thanks a lot
Dr. Shurojit Das, on behalf of everyone here today, thank you for volunteering your time to speak to us. Your talk was particularly appropriate at this time when we are at a juncture where policy making can no longer be conventional. Your insights and into the trends, patterns, and relationships of the various economic parameters uh, have been really uh, great, uh, helpful. And how these patterns are impacting the lives of so many people during lockdown was both fascinating yet disturbing. Uh, well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Dash. Uh, we will now begin our question answer sessions and there have been quite a number of interesting questions for both the speakers, addressed at both the speakers. Uh, the other participants who are interested can put in their queries in the chat box and we'll deal with them chronologically. Uh, the first few questions I will put to uh, Dr. Atre Pal and uh, our student Saurav Shukla. He has a number of questions and Saurav will be switching on the mic after uh, one or two questions. Okay, just uh, uh, wait for some time. Right, so the first question is from Dr. Tapush Pal. What modifications of labor laws do you suggest to protect the interests of migrating labor, uh, laborers in India? Okay. Uh, uh, can I, uh, shall I put them one after another or? Yes, uh, it will be easier. Okay, fine. You okay. can answer. Okay, uh, ma'am. Uh, so, sorry, uh, Tapush sir. Actually, the thing is that as we have discussed, that the uh, mainly these labor laws which have been dismantled and labor codes have been put in uh, their place. These labor laws actually work for the uh, uh, workers in the organized sectors. Okay, the migrant laborers who are actually mainly they are part of the informal sector. The labor law is actually not uh, the labor law actually don't hold for them. Rather, instead of uh, modification of labor laws, because they uh, they come out of the purview of the labor laws, because these labor laws are for the formal uh, workers. Now, the government, what uh, can be done is that the government has already announced uh, various schemes for the uh, migrant laborers who have returned back to their native place under this uh, Pradhan Manti Garib Kalyan Rozgar Yojana Abhiyan. Also, uh, they can, um, the government can also increase the scope of the Mahatma Gandhi Rega operation uh, in the rural sector as well as it can be extended further in the urban sector as Shubhajit sir said that the uh, Employment Security Act can be also in, uh, uh, expanded to the urban sector and uh, also the, another criteria is that if the self-help groups are encouraged further then also uh, several employment schemes can be considered can be increased for the migrant labors and their uh, problem their financial problem can be reduced to certain extents. Okay thank you ma'am. Uh, the next question is from Preetha Ghosh. Why is unemployment rate rising in rural India? Also, can the reforms reduce gender gap in the labor market? Okay, the first part that is already Shurajit sir has addressed that in the rural sector actually, uh, the rural sector is facing two burdens, so two burdens simultaneously. First, the burden of the returning migrant laborers who have returned from various towns and cities to their native places, and they are actually engaging in the agricultural farm sector in form of disguised unemployment. That is the first thing. And that, that is increasing the pressure on the land, the pressure on the rural sector, and the unemployment rate is increasing. This is the first thing. And second thing is that since the agricultural sector is unable to bear this burden, more and more laborers are being released and they are coming out as unemployed and they are trying to take part in the non-farm sector. And under this pandemic situation, the non-farm sector is also been unable to expand. It is not expanding uh, in a desirable manner. That is why it is on the government, as Sir said, Shurajit Sir said, that it is the government have to take a proactive role in order to expand its uh, 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 
investment in the say in the infrastructural sector and the in the more spending should be done in for the government so that uh, from the government side so that more public sector employment whether even if they are uh, casual or contractual in nature more employment has to be generated because uh, giving livelihood giving uh, employment to the people who are interested is uh, at, is the one of the major criteria it's one of the major thing that is required at this time i hope i have uh, uh, answered your first question and what was the second part ma'am can you repeat yeah second was uh, can the reforms reduce gender gap okay yes. and uh, okay okay thank you ma'am see as i have discussed in the um, uh, slides that Uh, most of the reforms have been dismantled and as you have seen that uh, the state of uttar pradesh who have which have already uh, taken up this reforms it has dismantled so many law you can see there are various laws relating to the welfare of the female workers that has been dismantled or suspended so for example the maternity benefit act then the equal remuneration act these uh, suspension of such laws actually calls for the calls which is an alarm actually to us where uh, when we are uh, talking about women empowerment on one one hand we are talking about reducing the gender bias suspension of such laws from the formal sector employment is actually hindering our way our uh, path to uh, develop the welfare of the women workers so this laws laws which have been actually formulated now which have been now brought into force are actually uh, if you see they are um, to some extent they are uh, to a great extent rather they are hindering the equal the gender equality of the workers because this benefits like maternity benefits equal pay for equal uh, work this type of benefits if they are not given if they are suspended then it would be a huge problem for the female workers and we have already seen that the female participation rate is already declining in indian economy and the this type of uh, laws formulation will further uh, lead to dismantling of eco gender equality in the economy thank you uh, officer in charge of bidhanagar college tapomoy das uh, he has he had a question for you uh, <coughs> sir can you please repeat your question uh, okay in the meantime is he speaking Uh, no i don't think so so in the meantime the next uh, query I'm, is I'm, okay i'm sorry sir sorry yeah please continue i'm trying to no my mine was question which in fact the after have listened to her which does not apply to her kind of argument it was different number 1 number 2 i i thought uh, she was essentially offering a hobbesian kind of logic but i find she was far from me it. it was not hobbesian or anti hobbesian okay so i have no uh, uh, i have nothing to say about what she has said already and i find i am quite satisfied with the way i have approached uh, with the way i have tackled my own question own problem okay thank you okay thank you sir Uh, the next question is from Soham. He is asking about the nature of difference between unemployment in rural and urban India. Okay, uh, in rural India, the most of the uh, unemployment, if you look at it, it is actually disguised unemployment because uh, the productivity of the agricultural sector is already low, and uh, with more uh, people being employed in the agricultural sector, the actually the um, uh, productivity of these labors is almost becoming zero. So, uh, in the rural sector, the employability, uh, the unemployment situation is more of disguised type. but in the urban sector what is happening is that since uh, due to this lockdown due to this uh, economic recession which has set in due to the pandemic uh, actually the number of jobs have uh, the uh, opportunities have actually decreased that it is a structural form of unemployment which is uh, occurring in case of uh, the urban sector i think shurojit sir will be able to uh, give little more uh, view on this scenario he has uh, worked in the ground level So, sir, can you please uh, throw some light on this? The difference between the structure, employment, unemployment prevailing in uh, rural and the urban sector. Okay, I'll add this that. Uh, okay, sir. Okay. 
Okay, to continue, the next is from Adit Tabho. Transfer payments being provided by state and central government to people in the name of financial aid and other schemes for consolidating their positions. Are these aids actually helping or setting back the economy and increasing unemployment? Uh, I think this pertains to both of you. Yes. A question. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me uh, just say that uh, in when the uh, pandemic set in and there was such a huge recession and uh, so many people lost their job, the initial one-shot relief measure that has been given to them in form of cash or in form of kind, whatever is the case, that is justified. Even the Nobel laureate economist, uh, Dr. Obhijit Vinayak Banerjee, he said that just print notes and hand over these notes, uh, hand over the money to the people who are in need because it is more important at that it was more important at that time to make the people survive because they had already lost a huge amount of income their livelihoods and all thing on their lives was were in danger that is one shot uh, recipe but this this cannot be a continuing and a sustainable program that uh, govern the transfer payments that are being given by the government as the name suggests they are only one-sided payment that is the payments that the uh, people are receiving a uh, general mass is receiving from the government without any form of work without any form of production against it no government whether it's central or it's the state can actually continue such a uh, measure because this will actually aggravate inflation in the long run and this will actually uh, give a huge put a huge financial burden on the state on the state or, the, or on the central government whatever is the case so this transfer payments can be one shot relief measure but this continuing them for uh, months after months is is not actually very logical rather if the government both central and state and also the local government they engage in various schemes implementing various schemes and constantly monitoring them Employment level is generated, then it will be rather better for the employability people in the long run, as for economic growth and overall development in the long run. Okay, over Thank to you. Dr. Shurojit Das. Uh, so the questions are quite, um, you know, they're quite uh, general. Uh, I think both of you can answer them. So uh, the first one is, uh, you know, there uh, all the questions are basically asking about the. Um, debt to GDP ratio being, uh, you know, coming down if government goes for expansionary policies. So, um, you know, whether they should be going uh, for hand handouts and et cetera, et cetera, and running down their uh, or increasing their deficits. So please address that. Are there other questions? Then yeah. I'm noting can I, down. Can I, yeah, ah, can you can just show these. Ah, ah, yes. Okay, uh, so Saurav, uh, uh, you can switch on your mic. If you have a few questions, please uh, ask. You may ask now. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, providing me this opportunity. So my questions were, uh, actually, I could not attend Surajit sir's all, uh, all the lecture. So my questions were, uh, three, ma'am, uh, most of them. So the first one is that, uh, the, um, uh, we can see that the government is trying to attract more and more FDIs, but uh, we can see also that our FDI uh, is already on a, uh, so showing us a, an increasing trend. But with that increase, we can also see that the unemployment is also on the rise. So I don't think that there is a positive uh, relation between FDI or employment. Actually, I uh, was attending a lecture on this. So there I, I did not study this topic a lot, but um, there the data through the data, I saw that the FDI and unemployment don't have. So there's no point in uh, focusing a lot on FDIs. Uh, is this one this is the my first question and the second one is that uh, we can see uh, that the state governments in india they are already like uh, they have already designed a lot of quotas uh, for social uh, causes like um, for the uh, backward classes and all so the quotas uh, reach to 50 to 60 percent uh, at the max level so don't you think that it would be uh, a good gesture 
for us like uh, to provide the remaining 50 percent uh, the the remaining 50 percent jobs that the uh, employers have they can like um, hire and fire this like segregating both the um, both the uh, like labor forces segregating them to classes uh, if we are to segregate in the first one so this uh, laws can be beneficial for the remaining 50 the hire and fire one this would be uh, i'm quite like i might sound a foolish so uh, because i am new to this subject and the third question is um uh, so, uh, the growth of bangladesh we are seeing that the growth of bangladesh is uh, re- they are doing really amazing because of this uh, they are actually pro employer uh, kind of economy and we can also see the debt to gdp ratio of the us which is a pro workers economy so the uh, the labor unions there have a lot of like power uh, on the employers so please shorten your to... question saurav yes ma'am so uh, these are my questions like uh, if you could segregate the quotas number 1 uh, number 2 is there an uh, uh, like is there a need for the government to in uh, to be bent on increasing the fdis and um, number 3 uh, was my uh, debt to gdp ratio question which has been already answered like which surajit sir will uh, already answer so these are my three questions number 1 fdi unemployment number 2 growth of bangladesh versus uh, a pro workers economy usa and number 3 the fifth, segregation of quotas and number 4 would be uh, the right to protest okay, okay. thank you uh, okay surajit okay. yes ma'am Oh. now i was just trying to put in all the questions <laughs> okay you know, at a go okay please answer okay now uh, regarding our first query that uh, where whereas um, when we are seeing that fdi is increasing uh, in, inflow of fdi is increasing but we are not seeing any uh, significant rise in the uh, employment i have already uh, uh, actually addressed this issue in my lecture where i said that there are uh, two significant two distinct forms of arguments regarding the labor sector reforms and the uh, one which was pro worker they said actually uh, no empirical evidence have been found no significant empirical evidence had been found regarding the uh, regarding presence of a positive correlation between increase of fdi which is uh, attracted by dismantling the labor law and actually increase in the employment see uh, this fdi actually which come to our economy they are mainly coming to the sectors which are not so much labor intensive Uh, if the government is able to attract fdi or it is uh, able to attract uh, a private investment in the labor intensive sectors then only the flow of fdi can have a positive correlation with the rise of employment that is important you have to link the flow of fdi with the sectors which are pro labors which are labor intensive that is the first thing second thing is that if we uh, talk about the hire and fire policy of the government you are saying that uh, 50% of say 50% of workers are uh, hired then they are fired out then again some other workers will get employment see this policy is uh, might be uh, it might uh, look uh, good from the uh, people who are uh, presently unemployed they might think that uh, if the permanent nature of employment is uh, ruled out and if uh, uh, all that all type of employments are made in uh, made such flexible that hire and fire is made easy then i might also get a chance uh, to get employment then there is also a chance that you will get fired out because if you if the labors don't have proper security if there is no security of employment i am leaving behind social security measures i am not talking about them if there is no security in your employment then your then the uh, then there might be the case that uh, and this uh, the productivity of the labor will also fall because see uh, productivity of labor is only not related to threats of being fired out uh, the employers are giving us the threat that you will be fired out if you don't possibly uh, do your productivity well uh, so under this threat we are doing well or we are producing well no not is that not that is not always the case 
if the laborers find that they have a security, the employers are providing with them with safety nets, with proper wages, then also the satisfaction of the laborers also increases their productivity. It is always not under the threat. So hire and fire policy, uh, which the government has introduced uh, under the industrial relations law, relations code, that has that I think from my end, I feel that should be re rethinked and it should be modified. Okay, and uh, particularly I didn't get your Bangladesh question. I didn't get it. What was the meaning of the Bangladesh question? I really didn't get it. Can, uh, can Tina ma'am please brief me up what he said? Uh, I think he was talking about Bangladesh's rise, you know, uh, GDP rise. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, these, uh, yeah, yeah. Bangladesh's GDP rise, uh, I think they, they do have a, a sort of, is it pro-worker policy? Because you were saying USA also has a pro-worker policy. So what was it? Bangladesh has a... Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, Bangladesh has actually, uh, like... Um, diluted their worker policies okay so yeah so okay. considering both these uh, economies have shown growth um, he's talking about a pro versus a you know negative uh, policy See, uh, actually, uh, ma, uh, as far as i think that when you are talking about a pro employer policy where the labor rights are diluted okay in uh, those cases uh, actually uh, sometimes uh, it might be fine that they uh, the actually in the case of bangladesh if you see though they have diluted the labor rights the most of the uh, uh, things that most of in most of the manufacturing industries they are actually now switching to I'm talking about the manufacturing industry. They are now switching to actually capital intensive form where more uh, amount of automation, more amount of machineries are being used. So we find that uh, even if there is labor dilution and cheap amount, cheap uh, labor is uh, available in the Bangladesh economy, that uh, it is not only the reason of the reason for the rise in Bangladesh. It is not only that the labors are cheaper, the labor laws are diluted. That is why uh, the Bangladeshi manufacturers or the economy, Bangladesh economy is actually booming. No, that, that is not the actual case. There are other reasons for Bangladesh economy uh, booming at this particular point of time okay i'm not very acquainted with the bangladesh economy uh, truly but uh, i don't feel that it is only the uh, diluted labor laws that have uh, initiated the growth in bangladesh oh okay so, shurujit uh, let me continue with the questions uh, why is the capital market outperforming other economic parameters in all the depression economies around the world this is from OC Budhanagar College once again. Uh, Soham uh, is asking, drawing down of savings to pay for consumption, uh, this phenomena of reduced savings and high borrowing of our people, will it be harmful in both the long run and short run of our economy in terms of growth prospects? Uh, Adit Tabu is uh, uh, asking, how can this debt financing be stopped and a budget surplus be achieved in the nearest possible time. Uh, Dr. Taposhpal is uh, talking about, uh, you know, he's asking whether there is a policy mix where, uh, let me get to his, yeah. Uh, whether there is a policy mix to ensure universal employment guarantee will direct money transfer or expansionary fiscal policy make India's public debt unsustainable in the present scenario? And uh, the, the last is, well, it's all about, you know, how to increase employment uh, during this pandemic era and how the public finance will be managed. Okay, okay thanks a lot. How much time do I have? Can we go up to, there are so many questions. Can we yeah, exactly. go up to, so... So you can choose, what time? You know, let no, us see. But um, I mean, I don't mind. I have time, but uh, <laughs> given the logistics, uh, can I speak for uh, 10, 15 yeah, minutes? Sure, yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Uh, and, okay. 
okay first thing is uh, rural urban employment unemployment yeah uh, uh, somebody asked to professor aptai pal and then uh, she was asking me to comment upon uh, you know this rural urban divide in india is very funny i mean uh, i think professor uh, not professor uh, I mean, dr p sainath the noted journalist he pointed out after the uh, census of 2011 that there was huge shift in urbanization and so on and so forth everybody was talking about so he pointed out this thing that basically this demarcation of rural and urban in india happens based on the population density and uh, the same area which was earlier rural now can be called urban uh, because of uh, the increase in population density and if the popul population density crosses that threshold so uh, there is another kind of division which is called rural urban in india that is where local bodies are panchayats and local bodies are municipalities and municipal corporations they are called urban and panchayat areas are called rural now this uh, uh, rural employment guarantee scheme is basically with the panchayat areas um, for all practical purposes so many municipal areas and you know urban the way we understand urban is basically the big cities or at least the district headquarters and surrounding areas etc uh, small kasbas and so on but um, uh, i mean uh, when we say that uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, this many population is living in urban areas in India. That means, which is around 40% or so, more than that. That means, basically, these small kasbas, small areas, suburban areas, uh, even rural areas with higher population density, they are all covered under that. So, until and unless there is some employment of last resort scheme in those areas, unemployment rate has increased enormously in those areas also. So people are suffering badly and they don't have any other option under this humanitarian crisis. So uh, uh, as far as uh, nature of unemployment and employment, she has already mentioned uh, disguised unemployment. And also some of our colleagues, they were doing longitudinal studies where they found that you know, we say that still more than 50% of the population or uh, workforce is dependent on agriculture directly or indirectly for their livelihood. That is partially true. You know? uh, now it is nobody is full time 100% farmer. Even uh, farmers are also side by side doing some other work or opening some small shops in the village areas or uh, you know opening some. I mean, so, so so they are not dependent solely. I mean, maybe they are dependent mainly on agriculture activity, but they are not dependent only on agriculture for their livelihood. So there is always a mixture in the rural areas. Urban, of course, there is no agriculture. So that is a major difference. Manufacturing and construction uh, industry has been affected very badly, tourism and many other things. So uh, uh, that uh, makes the difference. But uh, as far as aggregate situation is concerned, the employment opportunity has shrunk in almost all the sectors across the board. So uh until and unless demand is generated and purchasing power is generated in the hands of people and until and unless they are ready to spend then the economy cannot recover and employment aggregate employment scenario you know employment of last research program or mg NREG is not a solution of unemployment it is the employment of last resort if you don't get anything for 202 rupees you can work for a day but uh, for meaningful employment generation, the demand has to be revived under this severe demand depression. There is no other way. And that leads me to the other question, which was, uh, I think, uh, related to, OK, uh, there are uh, two, three questions related to this expansion of fiscal policy and debt to GDP ratio and this budget. Uh, OK, budget surplus. I am completely opposed to the idea of budget surplus. Budget surplus means what? Budget surplus means government would spend less money than what it would collect in the form of taxing the people in the, by, through taxation. So 
the money which would be collected by the government in the uh, by taxing the people government actually would spend less money than that that is called budget surplus that is completely unacceptable in fact almost all the countries in the world are running fiscal deficit maybe degree differs degree varies but fiscal deficit means when government spends more money than what it earns in terms of uh, tax and non tax revenues and under demand constraint situation it is absolutely essential that government incurs fiscal deficit and the expansionary uh, fiscal policy why do the governments of all all over world all the countries in the world run a fiscal deficit they are not uh, you know uh, i i don't think uh, it's uh, imprudent to run that i think they have realized that this expansionary fiscal policy ultimately helps in enhancing uh, growth and the employment generation in the economy in a positive manner that's why uh, they run it and i am completely in favor of fiscal deficit maybe not too much now how much would be too much can be debated but uh, zero fiscal deficit balanced budget or balance uh, surplus budget is in my view a bad 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 idea now uh, as far as uh, debt sustainability and debt gdp ratio is going somebody was pointing out i think a student that uh, uh, in us what is the debt to gdp ratio it is more than 100% in our country it is less than 60% the combined debt to gdp ratio of the uh, central government and state governments taken together uh, i mean calcutta economist uh, professor mihi rakshit has point out uh, pointed out um that until and unless it is not foreign borrowing until and unless uh, the government debt is primarily domestic in nature then uh, there is no leakage in aggregate demand and then whatever be your debt to gdp ratio nothing happens what happens i mean uh, many countries are there around the world during many years uh, they had more than 100% 150% 200% debt to gdp ratio what happens nothing happens it's basically an arrangement basically government is saying that you know there are two ways to finance government expenditures one by paying tax or two by lending to the government if you are given a choice uh, that you don't have to pay at, uh, or you have to pay less tax in order to finance the existing government expenditures and the rest of the amount you can lend to the government and hold some government securities in hand which is as good as money until and unless you have faith on the currency notes issued by the government you should there is no reason to believe that people would lose faith on the on the government securities or government papers so it is absolutely risk free uh, then people would obviously choose government to hold government papers rather than paying higher taxes to the government right so if taxation is a leakage of multiplier if uh, government collects more tax then ultimately the multiplier weakens in the economy and under a demand depression and severe negative shock like this i don't think it is a good idea uh, to to think too much about sustainability of debt to gdp ratio uh, what happens even if debt to gdp ratio goes up to 100% nothing happens okay for debt servicing maybe interest payment component of the government tax checker may increase but that would still be 9 to 10% of the total debt right not more than that so uh, more than 90% of the total borrowing can be utilized for incurring expend essential expenditures of the government so i am all in favor of the expansion of fiscal policy this is a personal opinion of course i mean there could be difference of opinion uh yeah inflation inflation does not happen necessarily inflation because of expansion of fiscal policy it is absolutely not necessary that there would be inflation in fact under a demand constraint or demand uh, uh, you know depression demand or demand constraint situation if even if demand increases because of higher fiscal deficit then why would there would be necessarily demand pull inflation demand pull inflation would happen only when aggregate demand is higher than the aggregate supply right now any inflation inflation any uh, i mean monetarists of course don't have in their syllabus anything called demand pull inflation they know 
I mean, uh, cost push inflation. Then only demand pull inflation. So otherwise, the inflation which we are witnessing is happening because of structural problems or because of the higher oil prices or because of the higher food and oil prices. These are all cost push inflation or structural inflation. They are not demand pull inflation. People have lost jobs. People have lost purchasing power. People have lost income due to severe lockdown in this country. It's a, such a big country. Millions of people are suffering. And uh, if somebody is talking about demand pull inflation, whenever there is a talk about you know, uh, uh, government support to them uh, in employment generation program or poverty alleviation program, I think it's very unfortunate. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's very interesting to note that why is inflation bad at the first place? Inflation is bad because it reduces our real purchasing power given our nominal income, right? Now, if in nominal income reduces, goes down to zero, whatever the inflation rate, how does it matter, right? Now, if there is a trade-off that my income, nominal income, can rise at a higher rate than the inflation rate, then my real income or real purchasing power would rise in the, I mean, I mean, in exposed situation, okay, when everything would settle down. Therefore, I think inflation is considerations should not be the priority right now under these circumstances. The priority of the government obviously should be to generate employment and to ensure at least minimum income for those who are needy and also for others, some meaningful employment opportunity. Otherwise, there are so many young students, they are studying economics. What would they do after passing out? They would be so depressed, they would have you know, uh, no hope, nothing. Now, our students are asking us, Sir, after one or two years, do you think the employment scenario would uh, revive, recover in the economy? I said, I don't know, but nobody knows. So, so that should be the first priority now, in my opinion, after this huge negative, worldwide huge negative shock for the country governments, rather than considerations of inflation and all. Most of our economics textbooks are written by uh, American economists and economists of the West. And I don't know, whenever there is a talk of expansionary fiscal policy, people would talk about crowding out and inflation and debt sustainability, these three things. But none of these are, uh, you know, necessary. Nor, you know, whenever government borrows some money and spends, that does not mean it would cause crowding out of in, uh, in uh, private investment, because there is a restrictive assumption that aggregate saving or uh, the pool of saving has to be fixed or constant. That cannot remain constant until and unless the aggregate income remains constant. And aggregate income does not remain constant until unless there is a full employment or full capacity assumption is involved. Okay, so if we this is a, a situation where there is huge unemployment and unutilized capacity in the economy, so there is absolutely no reason to believe that because of higher fiscal deficit there would be crowding out of private investment, there or there would be demand pool inflation. Okay, there could be supply push inflation or structural inflation. That's a different thing. But uh, because of higher fiscal deficit, if inflation at all happens, that would happen. Uh, th that would take in the form of demand pool inflation. That is not going to happen uh, under a demand severe demand depression like this, in my opinion. So uh, how to generate employment, etc., through expansionary Keynesian demand management policy that I have already talked about. Uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio, uh, uh, capital market. Why is capital market uh, uh, is uh, booming? And you know, sh our share market basically is booming because of two reasons, in my opinion. Number one, foreign investors. I mean, investment scenario has become uh, uh, bad everywhere. So uh, profitable offer because of the lockdowns and de uh, demand depression the profitable opportunities are less everywhere. So the share markets, which also can grow because of speculative things, if more money is coming, then uh, uh, the price of share, uh, the expected speculative gain from those share also might rise and price of the share also can rise. So in search of those profits, uh, maybe speculative profit, uh, the foreign money is entering into our share market as I was showing BSE Sensex is continuously growing and also 
not only foreign investors are investing in share markets also domestic investors particularly the mutual funds mutual funds are seeing that there is no demand for credit or there is no investment demand under such a situation they can't keep their money idle it would not fetch any interest earning so they are putting a lot of money into our share market so that you no know, at least some uh, rate of return would uh, take place that is why probably our capital markets are growing and it has nothing to do with what is happening in our real economy at the ground and saving is uh, reducing borrowing is in increasing so it would have obviously severely negative effect it would uh, obviously if my saving goes down or if i am indebted then my uh, uh, future uh, given my purchasing power and income my future consumption level would come down um, and if future consumption demand comes down then obviously the uh, growth would be lower uh given any value of multiplier uh, even if the value of the multiplier would also be lower because consumption propensity would come down so it can have a negative impact on the growth and level of output level of activity in the longer run definitely uh i think that's it tina yeah so thank you shuruji uh, uh no i think it. this is about it all uh so uh yeah uh, we can understand uh, how interesting and vibrant this webinar have has been you know by the number of questions and that most of and that most of the participants have remained you know even at this late hour so i would now invite dr tapesh kumar pal to deliver uh, the vote of thanks a very good <coughs> evening to everyone gathered here in the one day national webinar on lockdown social security and perspective it is my great pleasure and i am very much proud to deliver vote of thanks to such distinguished dignitaries in this event at the outset i would like to thank our officer in charge mr tapumoy das of vidhanagar college and principal Barasat Government College, Dr. Samur Chattopadhyay, for their serious and inspiring patronage to make this webinar fruitful. Let me express my gratitude to Dr. Atri Pal, Assistant Professor of Economics, University of Kolkata, for her valuable speech on labor law reforms and social security. Ma'am, your oration was so thought-provoking; it really made us think, us to think. thank you ma'am i take this opportunity to thank dr surajit das assistant professor of economics cesp jawaharlal nehru university for his precious insights into the topic some aspects of impact of covid 19 induced lockdown in india and the way forward your speech was truly inspiring and it kept us spellbound we express sincere gratitude to you sir we offer our sincere thanks to the organizing committee joint convenors co convenors and technicians as without their cooperation the program might not have been possible last but not least i would like to thank our students teachers everyone for participating in the webinar once again thank you all this is the end of the webinar expecting to see you again thank you thank you sir thank you all thanks a lot thank you sir and uh, thank you for inviting me thank you the organizer and thank you shurajit sir for letting us know so much information from the ground up level